Good evening. I'm Mark Leary, and as president of the Society for Personality and Social Psychology, I welcome you to our 16th annual convention. I hope those of you who spent the day in pre-conferences had an interesting and enjoyable day, and I hope all of you have really rested up for the overstimulating and unrelenting barrage of personality and social psychology we're all going to confront in the next few days. Uh, to begin this evening, I would like for Jamie Pennebaker to join me on stage. As most of you know, Jamie was president of SPSB last year for 2014, and I wanted to take the opportunity to acknowledge the time and hard work that he put into to the society last year. Depending on how you look at it, Jamie had either really good fortune or really bad fortune to be the president who was serving as we made this giant transformation of SPSB from an organization that was managed by a single executive officer who was one of us, was Jack DeVideo most recently, to a real full-fledged organization with a, an executive director and a four-person staff and a real bricks and mortar office in Washington, D.C. Jamie was involved with Trish Devine, David Funder, Wendy Wood, Jack DeVideo, and others in creating this central office that started just a year ago and in selecting its first director, who you're going to meet in just a moment. And during his term as president, Jamie was involved in both the joys and the massive hassles of engaging in this transformation from a very different kind of administrative structure to the one that we've developed that exists now. So in appreciation for his dedication to both SPSP and to the science of personality and social psychology, I would like, like to give Jamie this plaque on behalf of the organization, it has a gavel on it, which is very ironic because in our executive committee meetings, Jamie steadfastly refused to ever use a gavel. I guess now it's kind of cemented on the plaque, he never has to use it. But anyway, thank, thanks to Jamie Pennebaker. Just a brief peek at this massive program that you've received should be enough to show you that a whole lot of people put a whole lot of work on a whole lot of different tasks in order to pull all of this together this weekend. So here at the outset, we want to thank those who led the way in organizing the convention. And I'd like to start with Keith Payne, the chair of the convention committee. So let's show our appreciation to Keith, who is going to introduce some of the other people who helped on the program. Thank you, Mark. Um, I want to thank just a few of the many people who have been working hard all year round to uh, make the convention possible today. First, though, let me start by thanking you. Our uh, society is growing, both in terms of numbers and in terms of impact, and our convention continues to grow, too. Uh, this year, we have 3,563 attendees, which is one of the largest um, conventions that we've had. I want to thank the awards committee, um, which is chaired by David Funder, and the diversity and climate committee, chaired by Victoria Plout. I want to thank the graduate student committee, uh, headed by Elizabeth Kineski, and the training committee, headed by John Maynard, training our graduate students, integrating them into the field, and increasing our diversity are some of the most important things that we do as a society. I also want to thank the pre-conference organizers. This year we had 29 pre-conferences, and I believe uh, all of them sold out. Uh, the demand for those pre-conferences continues to grow each year. I also want to thank the reviewers for the Graduate Student and Diversity Travel Awards. This year we were able to double the number of travel awards that we uh, provided, and as a result, we were able to provide over $115,000 in travel funds for students. I want to thank the Social Personality and Health Network, who is organizing the 5K Run and Walk, which is tomorrow morning, bright and early. And I want to thank the GLBT Alliance in Social and Personality Psychology, who not only does great work, but has probably the coolest acronym, GASP. They are organizing the GASP Mentor Lunch, which is also tomorrow. 
And I want to thank our corporate sponsors, including Sage Publications, uh, who supports our award ceremony, which will be right after this session, and both Sona Systems and Millisecond Software, who support our graduate student uh, social event. And last but not least, um, I want to thank two people who have probably the biggest job of all, which is putting together our scientific program that we're all about to be a part of. So please join me in thanking uh, Nathan Duall and Samin Vizier. Thank you, Keith. That was very nice. Uh, so first off, uh, we have, as Mark was uh, mentioning, we have an enormous program. And it really wouldn't be possible for us to, uh, to have this program without many of you uh, who were generous enough with your time uh, to review uh, uh, the, the different sessions. Uh, these are our reviewers. I want to thank all of them publicly. We had 42 reviewers. We had 2,725 reviews that were conducted. That's two times each for a total of uh, 5,450 uh, reviews. So uh, please help me uh, to thank the symposia chairs uh, who submitted this year. Please help me. So to tell you a little bit more about the program, we had 215 symposia submitted and 84 were accepted, so it's a 39% acceptance rate. Um, in terms of posters, we have 2,256 posters at the conference, and we also have 24 data blitz presentations. Um, in addition to these regular programs, we also have several professional development sessions, including the undergraduate Q&A, a session on women in academia, a lunchtime session on how to publish, and another one that's a funding roundtable, and a forum with teaching faculty. We also have a number of special events, including the awards ceremony immediately after this session, an opening reception, a convention kickoff breakfast, we have awards lectures on Friday, and poster social hours on both Friday and Saturday, and the diversity and climate committee reception. All this information and updates, the most current information is available on our mobile app, including schedules, maps, speaker bios. Um, you can connect with other attendees. And this app can be downloaded from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. So back to you, Mark. Thank you. As I mentioned, SPSB has undergone great changes in the past year. And I'd like to introduce the man who has been at the helm in terms of put it, pulling it all together, and that's Chad Rummel. Chad came to us from a stint at the American Psychological Association. So he came to us well prepared to manage a large organization. And as I understand, he worked, had worked with enough psychologists and faculty members in the past that it didn't come as a shock to him what we're actually like. Uh, Chad has done a tremendous job of setting up this office in Washington, hiring his staff, and managing the day-to-day -day activities of the society. I know that some of you have been surprised when you signed on to the SPSB website this year and little box popped up asking whether the person behind the box could help you. And some of you thought it was just a robotic piece of software trying to be polite. No, they're real people, Chad and his staff, responding to every need that we have. So I've asked Chad to introduce the staff so that you'll know who the people are in Washington who are taking care of the business on our behalf. Chad Rummel. Thank you, Mark, and I too would like to welcome you all to Long Beach for our convention. You can thank me for the sun. I did place the order last week. I especially want to welcome our friends in the Northeast who haven't seen the sun in a while. Welcome to Long Beach. As Mark said, we are very fortunate to have at SPSP a group of people that work behind the scenes 40 hours a week to make this convention happen as well as run the other activities of the organization. We're in Washington, D.C. supporting social and personality psychology year-round, and I think it's important that we recognize those people who are doing that work for you. I'm going to point them out in the audience and embarrass them because they told me not to, so here we go. I first want to recognize our operations manager, Brian Riddleberger, who handles all of our finance and membership. Brian, are you in the room? Brian escaped. I knew it. One always gets out. Um, you'll be happy to know that Brian's also been working this last year on a web development relaunch to make our website more user-friendly and add more resources to it. In addition, in the next month, we'll be launching a new special interest group community on our website, which means the return of the SPSP listserv. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. 
So look for that coming out in the next month. If you have questions about that, talk to our membership booth down in the main lobby. They can give you a preview of SPSB Connect, which again launches in the next month. Our next staff member has been with us actually for a few years. She joined the staff before I did, and that's Ms. Susie Schroeder, our Chief Financial Officer right down here. Give her applause. I know many of you are based at universities, so you're used to working with accounting departments that know nothing but black and white. There's no in-between. Susie is very fortunate, we're very fortunate to have Susie being somebody who knows black and white, but also knows every other color in between and works to make those colors make things happen for SPSB. So we're very appreciative of Susie. Our next staff member is Jen Santisi right over here. Jen came, yes, give her applause. Jen is our communications director. She oversees our media relations department, um, issuing press releases from our journals and also from individual researchers in our society who reach out and ask for help getting press. Um, Jen talks daily to the media about the work you're doing to get it out there. Jen has coordinated, um, I believe, about 20 reporters who are here this weekend covering sessions to make sure that the world knows how important what you do really is. Does that make sense? Yes, there we go. Um, Jen also manages our social media and our website as well. And finally, last but definitely not least, is Mr. Nate Wombold right over here. <laughs> Nate is our meeting and events director, and if it looks like he hasn't slept in a week, he hasn't. He's been busy organizing the final logistics of the 30 pre-conferences you all attended today. That's all been Nate on the back end making that happen, hopefully pretty seamlessly for you. Um, Nate's in charge of the convention and other activities, including it, liaising with the graduate student committee. And finally, um, in addition to these folks, we also have in our office, we have three interns from George Washington University who work um, helping support membership, answering questions. They're often the faces behind that little box that pops up. Um, you get a lot of emails from these guys who are working also to support you. They're psychology students. Um, and if anybody in the Washington, D.C. area is interested in an internship next year, please find me this weekend. Um, again, thank you for allowing us to be a part of Social and Personality Psychology, and we look forward to enjoying the convention with you this week. Thanks. Thanks, Chad. If you cross paths with any of these people this weekend, stop them and say hi and thank them for what they do for us. I must say I feel very fortunate to be president with the central office completely up and running, and it really makes me appreciate how previous presidents and the executive directors, how they got by without Chad and his staff, I really don't know. Most of us decided to go into this field because we concluded somewhere along the way, probably in undergraduate school, that the things that social and personality psychologists studied were uniquely interesting to us, among the other things we studied in college. And we felt like it was really relevant to our understanding of human behavior, and maybe to our personal lives. And I think that most of us in this room believe not only that most of what we do is directly relevant to just understanding human beings, but that much, maybe not everything we do, but much of it is directly relevant to a variety of very important problems and issues at both the individual and the societal level. But I also suspect that many of you share my frustration and my puzzlement that not a great deal of all of this stuff that we think is utterly interesting and fascinating and important, that not much of it gets out into the public eye or into the hands of the decision makers of society, whether that's in business or education or government or public policy or whatever. You and I can see the relevance of personality and social psychology everywhere we look, so why isn't it obvious to everybody how relevant and important our work is? Well, that's the question we're going to confront in this opening symposium. I've invited four speakers, all of whom have confronted this issue in one way or another, to give us their thoughts on how collectively we might cultivate the relevance of social and personality psychology for science, for public policy, for decision makers everywhere, and for the average person. Let me introduce the four speakers, and then we'll proceed without a lot of fanfare and introduction in between. We're going to start with Bob Cialdini from Arizona State. Bob's been advocating the relevance of, advocating that we really promote the relevance of personality and social psychology for as long as many of us have been in the field, and I suspect that sometimes Bob's felt that he's been a rather lone voice in the wilderness crying out for us to do this. Well, he's not a lone voice tonight. There are other people crying out, and it's not the wilderness anymore, so we're really glad to have Bob with us. He'll be followed by Jackie White of the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, 
who got a first-hand look at how the people on Capitol Hill think about the relevance of social and behavioral science. Uh, she was engaged in a confessional, con, con, not a confessional, a congressional <laughs> fellowship. <laughs> Maybe she also will do some confessional while she's here tonight. Uh, a con congressional fellowship, and she lived to tell about it, and she's going to let us know why our findings don't always fly among the people in government. Will Fleeson from Wake Forest University will then approach the relevance question by focusing on the relevance our finding, of our findings for promoting happiness, human well-being, psychological adjustment, and will conclude with Bill Klein of the National Cancer Institute and University of Pittsburgh, longtime faculty member at Colby College, who has found himself thinking a lot about the relevance of social and personality psychology in the context of funding for scientific research. And we're going to move from one speaker to the other without any introductions. And then when we get to the end, if we have time, we're going to open things up for questions and comments from you. And by the way, as a programming note, um, many of you, particularly the students, uh, have a poster session coming up at 7 o'clock, and you feel like you need to get there and set things up. We're going to try to wrap this up about a quarter of 7 so people can get to the places they need to go, the award ceremony or the poster session or whatever. So don't feel like you need to rush out before we're done. So to start us off, please welcome Bob Cialdini. Well, uh, thank you, Mark. I'm very pleased to be here and um, can begin with uh, what the uh, title of this, of, of this session is, Cultivating the Relevance of Social and Personality Psychology for Science, Policy, and the Average Person. Well, it seemed that the other speakers who you'll be hearing this evening were covering some of those other bases. So I thought I would take uh, a shot at the last of those domains, the, the average person and how we could make our field relevant to their interests and, um, and their, uh, uh, their funding choices, actually, and, uh, because in any really meaningful way, um, They've paid for the research that we do. They've paid for it. So they're entitled to know what we found out with their money. So let's talk about that and um, begin with the title of my presentation, uh, which is Relevance Can Be Fostered Through Research Settings, Research Populations, and Questions. And I thought that was going to be my presentation topic today because I thought the way to optimize our relevance to the public would be to choose investigations that in, into which the average person could find him or herself. They, they're part of the population we'd be studying. They have found themselves, they're able to locate themselves in the settings where we might choose to um, uh, conduct our investigations. And they would find themselves in the issues that we're interested in. And so that was going to be my presentation. And then upon reflection, I recognized that um, I was wrong uh, and that there was something missing. Even if we arranged to do those things, we wouldn't be showing the average person the relevance of our work unless we also arranged for them to have access to it in some sort of channel that was easily available to them. Um, and we often don't do that. Let me give you an example of how uh, I made a mistake in that regard. A few years ago, a long time ago actually, a long time ago, I was an assistant professor and decided that there was an interesting question that the average person would enjoy knowing the answer to, and that was, how would it be possible to predict the results of a presidential election right, before any votes were cast without conducting uh, and uh, an opinion poll, um, but instead by using 
a fundamental psychological tendency that had never been used in this regard. It's the tendency uh, that comes from uh, Heider's balance theory, the idea of unit connections, the idea that people want to associate themselves. They want to unitize with those things they like. They want to dis associate themselves, they want to unlink themselves from those things they don't like. If that's the case, maybe we could predict presidential elections without uh, prior opinion polls or without uh, post uh, uh, exit polls by putting flyers on people's windshields when they went in to vote. Half of the flyers advocated one of the candidates, the other half advocated the other candidate. If Heider's right, we should be able to predict who's the winner of the election by just looking at how many flyers of each type were littered, take the reciprocal, and we'd get the winner. The person whose flyers were littered the most would lose in that precinct. The one who is littered the least would win. You associate yourself. You want to link to those people you like. You want to disassociate from those people you dislike. So we did this study. Right? And we went to nine uh, precincts in the Phoenix, Arizona area where I live. Right? And then we were able to correctly predict the winner at all nine precincts. Okay, well, I thought this had all the, all the conditions necessary. I mean, people can find themselves in this population. They've been voters. They can find themselves in that setting. They know where the polls, what the polls are like. They can, they'd be interested in this, this outcome. And then I published these results in an academic journal and promptly buried them there. I buried them alive because there was, in terms of impact on the average person, there is none, none. Nobody knows about this. I didn't put it in a medium where the average person could get access to it. It didn't matter that I had crossed all those T's and dotted all those I's. Nobody knew about it. So there are these days However, a lot of opportunity, a lot of these channels available to us that I think we can use. Let me list a few of them. Right? Newspaper op-eds, uh, magazine and web-based articles, columns, blogs. But here's one that I would like to recommend. It's one that a lot of your colleagues have been undertaking uh, over the years, uh, myself included. It's popular books, writing for a popular audience and translating what we do to those individuals who um, might be interested in what we do. And, and I have to say that uh, I've written three books now and uh, they have sold more copies than I could have sensibly imagined when I began. And I think that's true for a couple of reasons. The first is um, we have a lot to offer and people are ravenously interested in what we have found that's relevant to them, provided that we present it properly for them. So here's how I've learned some things to present information uh, to the, uh, the general public over the years, and I'll just uh, cover those and, and finish up there. The first step that we need to take in this regard is something you've heard before. Start with a detailed prospectus, along with a pair of sample chapters, and send them to multiple potential publishers or um, agents. It's not like sending it to a journal. You don't have to send them one at a time. You send them multiply. And you get interest. 
which if there are multiple people interested, they then bargain against one another to get your book. Okay, so you do that. Now, um, once you've done that, before you send these things out, rewrite that chapter or those chapters over and over to squeeze out all of the academic language, all of the jargon that we typically use. And then when you've done that, do it one more time. Because as academics, we don't recognize the extent to which the terms that we think represent everyday parlance are not recognized, are not understood by the average person. Let me give you some, uh, some evidence in this regard. Um, a survey that was done by the National Museum of uh, Natural History right, asked people, a random sample of US adults, right, um, do you have a strong or moderate interest in the study of botany? And 39% said, yes, I do. But if they asked the other half of the participants, do you have a strong or moderate interest in the study of plants and trees? 77% said, yes, right on, I do. How about zoology? 59 cent. Well, yes, the study of zoology, I, I, I have an interest in that. How about animals, though? 87 percent. Well, maybe that's too hard science. What about something closer to us, the social or behavioral sciences? Uh, anthropology, strong to moderate interest in the study of it, 44 percent. But peoples of the world? 81%. So we think we know what we, that there is shared meaning when we say anthropology, and it, it, we don't. We have to simplify our language in order to optimize relevance. Simpler than we think. Now, of course, we can't get so simple that we insult people's intelligence let me give you an example of what that would look like. Here's an ad. This is a real ad. Right? For the vehicle pet barrier, $59.99. But notice, we're reminded that the deal doesn't include the dog and the vehicle. No, you don't get those along. Right? We don't want to go there. That's the sub-basement. So how do we, how do we use what we might have available to us to target the right level of discourse. And it turns out it's not that difficult. We should use as our standard the magazines that already exist in our society whose mission it is to communicate behavioral science to uh, the general public. Discover, Psych Today, uh, I Like Scientific American Mind does a very good job. They hire people who are good at that. Right? And they get feedback as to which articles are, are, are most appreciated so they can retain those individuals who do write that way and, and, and uh, not those individuals who don't. So we get a good idea there of uh, the, the, the level of discourse that seems to work well. Um, we can also be sure not to write that book in our academic audit office. It's a mistake. Because every time you lift your eyes from the page, the sight lines will bring you into contact with a set of cues that are associated with an academic way of thinking, of, of, of arguing, an academic diction, an academic uh, syntax. This happened to me when I was writing my first book. I was on sabbatical, and I, was, I had an office 
in a high building overlooking the, the campus. So all these strongholds of academic scholarship out my window. I also had a rented apartment in town where I rode in front of a different window where I saw people walking back and forth. They were doing, they were going to work, they were going to lunch, they were going to coffee, they were going to shop, they were going to do a hundred ordinary things that people ordinarily do. And after a while, I, writing in those two places, I decided to consolidate the two piles of papers and I noticed something remarkable. What I was doing at home was miles better than what I was doing in my academic office because it was, it was speaking and arguing in a way that was representative of the people I was seeing. Those were the people who were being cued, who were cueing for me an appropriate diction and style and approach. I'll give you an example of the, the, so that, for example, the first line in my first book for a popular audience originally was, my home discipline, experimental social psychology, has as one of its subdomains the study of everyday human behavior. Right? I took that home and it became, the first line in that book became, I can admit it freely now, all my life I've been a patsy. That's, that was a difference, right? One place versus, don't write, or if you are going to write in your university office, write in front of a window where you see students walking by. They're the kind of people you would write for under these circumstances. Okay, that's, all right. Use both shoulders, because a shoulder is a terrible thing to waste. Here's what I do when I write. I don't allow myself to go to the next paragraph until I have satisfied two people that I've put over my shoulders. One is an authority in the arena I'm writing about. The other is a neighbor. If I haven't satisfied both in my mind, I don't get to go to the next paragraph. We've got both, we've got two shoulders. Why, why not use both? Typically, we just put that, that expert, that colleague over our shoulder. No, our neighbor deserves a spot there too. Okay, okay well, if that's the case, how about getting the content right? If we've got the level of, of, um, uh, uh, of discourse right, how do we do that? Well. One thing we can do is don't fall victim to a particularly troublesome version of the false uh, consensus effect. And that is the appeal of open questions for us as academics. We are virtually alone in this regard. Every other profession prioritizes answers over questions, except academics. We love the unsettled issue for a couple of reasons. We're a curious lot, but secondly, let's be honest about this. Without those unanswered questions, where would our careers be? Right? How, we wouldn't have anything to research. So we love those individuals who open up a field for us. It's not like uh, in medicine, somebody who provides the cure for cancer, or the cure for polio is lionized. No, no, we like those people who open up a lot of questions so we can dive in and answer those questions in ways that are consistent with our goals. Right? Okay. Don't project that reverence 
for questions on the everyday individual who by and large is much more interested in certainty than uncertainty. Now, let's be very careful about what I am not saying here and then I'm gonna finish. And that is I'm not saying that we ought to propose that we have answers when we don't have confident answers. Not, no, no, we can't do that. But I am saying we should prioritize material that we present in which there, we can make, for which we can make confident statements. And, which, we, which comes to the last of these things, deliver confident implications of what they can do with this material because the therefores are the gold standard of relevance for the average person. They want to know what we can tell them to do differently now than what they were doing before based on what we've learned with their money. So I'll finish my remarks at this point and be glad to answer questions uh, during the Q&A period and turn things over to Jack. Thank you, Bob, that was great. Actually, everything that Bob said is relevant to my talking about advocacy working with Congress, except maybe the part about confessing that you're a patsy. You might wanna, might wanna forget that part. I am, first of all, just really, really thrilled that Mark put together this panel. I think that his doing this is an absolutely perfect example of the message that I would like to um, get across to you today. And really, I'll give you my take, I'll take away message first, which is what you always do when you're doing advocacy work. The bottom line comes first, is I hope that all of you walk away from here feeling a much greater, a much higher level of mutual respect between basic researchers, applied researchers, translational researchers, and policy advocates. And I think I can say that with great legitimacy because my whole career has sort of spanned all of these realms. I began as a young assistant professor doing laboratory-based experimental social psychology work. And you know what? I didn't really have much use for all that applied stuff and certainly not policy stuff. That's not what we're, we're all about. But um, as my work evolved, and I, do, I, I started out doing research on human aggression, I began to do interpersonal aggression. You really have to get into the real world to study that. I began to do more survey research. That took me into doing things that actually involved talking to people in the community, community-based research. Throughout all of that was this growing frustration that the work that we were doing was not having the impact that I felt like it should have when you're dealing with something as significant as human violence. And it got me interested in policy, and I will put in a plug here for both APA as well as AAAS because I did have the opportunity to go and work in Washington as a staffer in the office of a member of Congress for a year to really understand science policy, attitudes towards science as well as um, why our, our work is ignored so much. And so, um, with that said, and I think Mark paraphrased this in his opening remarks this evening, but he had this quote from his newsletter um, in the SPSS newsletter back in January, really raising this question about why people don't see the relevance of the work that we do because what we do is very relevant. Well, I've learned some things um, from my year in Washington that might provide some insights into this. First of all, 
one thing is that social psychology really does have a lot to understanding why politics works the way it does. And this is the confessional, I'll, I'll, I'll confess. There were days that I was on the Hill that I was so overwhelmed by what looked like unbelievable craziness and insanity. And my therapy was to read the research that social psychologists do on political attitudes. It kept me sane, it kept my feet on the ground, it helped me understand why the wackadoodle stuff that was going on was going on in a way that I think I could then talk to other people about it. If you don't understand where other people are coming from, it's gonna be very, very difficult to intervene. So thank you all. Um, I'm probably here insane because of some of the work that you've done. And on a more serious note, social psychology really does have a lot to offer to the, the really significant um, issues that are challenging the country and the world. And so we really do, I think, have an obligation to figure out how to do that. With that said, there is an incredible need for all of us. We need the basic research. We need the applied research. And we need people who are doing the policy work. And my big goal or desire would be to see these different camps really come together, work together, toward solving these sorts of problems. Um, when I first entered graduate school, I think somebody said, well, you know the correlation between attitudes towards basic research and applied research is negative 8.8. Eight. Um, we need to change that. We need to make that more like positive 0.8. Um, so what, what is it that's going on? Well, first of all, there's ideology. This, this just permeates everything political from on the whole liberal conservative spectrum. And then there are interests. Different politicians have different kinds of interests. And so if you're interested in creating jobs, the way in which you think about job creation is going to be very different depending on your political ideology. And it's going to be informed by the information that you have. And unfortunately, as Bob so clearly told us, most of the really good information that's rooted in science never gets to the desk of a politician. And so the information they have is very piecemeal, it's anecdotal, and it's local. For every politician, the bottom line is, what am I going to do to get votes? Because they're always running for election. And so you ha that has to be part of sort of our calculus when we think about working with politicians. How are we going to help them get elected by solving our problems? The other thing that, inter and so that leads to the policy positions. But one of the things that we learned in, um, in our fellowship year, there was a, a class of us, in our, uh, and AAAS gave us lots and lots of training on policy, and um, one of the things we learned was it's the three Ps. Policy, procedure, politics. Policy, procedure, politics. You can never disentangle these sorts of things. So policy, what is it that you're talking about? But the procedures, Congress has a really, really complicated way of making decisions. And there's one set of rules on the Senate side and another set on the House side. And that these rules work in a way to either facilitate advancing legislation, impeding it, or just completely stopping it. So the use of the filibuster, for example. And so you have to understand how all of these things interact. And you know what? It's social psychology in action. I mean, there were days that I would be on the Hill going, I feel like I'm looking at the table of contents to an introductory social psychology textbook because everything that we teach is relevant. It's really, it was just so fascinating. You could teach an entire course based on how people function in Washington. Here's the bad part. Evidence is often the last thing considered. We as scientists, we believe that our data speak for themselves. No, they don't. Even when you have somebody very articulate speaking for them, it's hard to get the evidence heard. And so we want to figure out what would be the kinds of strategies that we could engage in. So just a few more observations um, to answer that question, why? First, again, introductory psychology, psych 101 stuff. Facts do not get in the way of ideology. I saw it time and time again that people's capacity to ignore data, if it challenges their deeply held beliefs, is just, it, it's just staggering. And it's one thing to read the newspapers, to see it on the news, but when you are physically 
in, on Capitol Hill every day and you see it up close and personal, it is, it is really kind of overwhelming. And so we heard on the news the other day some politician is saying, well, you know cancer is really just a fungus. Like, what? Um, well, can't women just swallow a camera when they're having a gynecological exam? What? You, ju we, you just hear this crazy stuff, and you, you have to remember the ideology so trumps grasp of evidence. Another issue is that um, how politicians, and this probably relates to the lay public as well, they, they don't really know how to use data. They don't know how to interpret it. So, for example, they confuse correlation and causation all the time. This is just classic. So, for example, uh, depending on your ideological stance, it's easy to say, well, you know, if we give people welfare checks, if we give them food stamps, we are going to cause them to be lazy because there's this correlation between being on welfare, having food stamps, and not working. And so you figure out, you infer what the causal direction is. Um, and, and, and you just, that's a very, very common kind of mistake, the confusing of correlation and causation. And the good old fundamental attribution error comes in there as well. Um, just really wanting to blame the person for their plight. And of course, we as social psychologists are so trained in thinking about the way the context influences behavior that it's sometimes I would find myself going, well, isn't that self-evident? Well, it's not. It's very easy to hold the individual responsible for whatever happens to him or her, and if something bad happens, what well, was their, or their, their own fault? Another piece is ignoring base rate um, information. People really like to just, well, their capacity to, to do mental math is, is pretty bad. Um, so, for example, I remember being at one congressional hearing and there was a, a member of Congress from a relatively rural area going on and on and on about the tens of thousands of people who work in small businesses that were being affected by a piece of legislation. And I'm thinking, you know, the population in that particular county and the number of small businesses, they don't have tens of thousands of people employed by small businesses. It's not mathematically possible. And yet these great, huge claims are being made. Um, so they just don't pay attention to the numbers. And they don't pay attention to things like base rates. So for example, um, the office that I was working in was Congresswoman Diana DeGette from Denver, Colorado, and she's very involved in a lot of the gun, gun, uh, gun control legislation. And so after the Sandy Hook shootings, I was on the Hill that year, we were very involved in all the mental health and gun violence hearings and briefings. And nobody ever stopped to look at the data on what we know about the number of times guns that are in homes are actually used on the, the gun owner in a home invasion. And if you pay attention to some of these base rate phenomena, you might come to a different conclusion. Again, they just don't pay attention to that. Um, another point that um, also happens is the sensational, though rare event, gets a lot of attention at the expense of ongoing serious social problems. So for example, with the Sandy Hook um, mass shooting in the schools, suddenly it was all about guns and serious mental illness. And people, pe uh, repeatedly, people would say, wait a minute, most people with mental illness are not violent. Um, Gun-related deaths and injuries are much more of a problem when you're talking about cases of domestic violence, children accidentally getting access to guns, um, look at the role of guns in suicide. These are really the significant social problems we should be talking about when we're talking about guns. But that wasn't interesting. It was, no, we got to arm the teachers in the schools, and we have to. Um, I was at one briefing, and they, br they, they brought in only psychiatrists. It's really hard for psychologists to get to the table in DC. And these psychiatrists were coming in and saying, oh, well, we just need to diagnose children at an early age, find the ones who are on the path to serious mental illness, get them on medication, and we'll solve the problem. So they look for these splashy, what are really rare events, and then a quick fix. And of course, the pharmaceutical, oh, none of you are related to the pharma industry in here, but the pharmaceutical industries are very good at pushing the idea that there's a pill to fix everything. So there was that sort of thing. 
The other thing that I saw over and over is that it's really challenging if somebody's a member of a marginalized group. The sexism, the racism, the classism, the homophobia are unbelievably um, prevalent to the point where literally there would be days that I would, I, I, were, I uh, lived near the Capitol so I could walk home every evening. I would literally walk home in tears some nights just because I could not comprehend how there could be such vitriolic animosity toward these, these groups. It was, it was, it, and again, it's, you hear it on television, you know it's true, but when you're there every day, you're in the Capitol Hill, this seat of power, this beautiful building, and then there's this, this vitriolic animosity towards so many groups of people. It, it's really quite overwhelming. And then, of course, all of this is compounded um, in the current climate by a serious unwillingness to work together to come up with common sense solutions. The idea of working together just isn't there. So what are some of the things that we could do to improve this? I'm going to skip, skip along here. Um, and I think this relates to a lot of things that Bob was saying. We don't do a good job of framing our message. Um, we have to figure out how to tell it in a way that appeals to them. So you're interested in animals or trees or that sort of thing. Um, we need to do it in a timely manner so that whatever we're advocating for really needs to be related to current legislation. And we have to be very strategic. And this um, strategic means that we need to coordinate with a lot of other people. You just can't, one person isn't going to be very effective. But if it's a very coordinated strategic appeal um, that's timed with whatever the current legislation is, it helps. And then the message also has to go to the right people. And this, again, it is, works best when you work with um, a government relations office through APA or uh, SRCD. There, there are lots of professional societies that have government relations people who really know who's got the power to make something happen. If a particular member of Congress isn't on a particular committee, um, they're not going to be very influential. And you have to come up with the right appeal. So what might some of those appeals be? Well, over time, there are some themes that have emerged that if you can cast your message in a way that appeals to the econ economy of some sort, it could be something you're improving efficiency or you're improving jobs or you're um, re saving money, that's helpful. Anything that's related to security, and again, that can be broadly defined from terrorism to um, safety issues, even to retirement, social security kinds of issues, lots of different ways that you can play the security card. Um, education is, at least it used to be, a big sale the, sell these days. I'm not quite sure <laughs> how strong of an appeal to education is. But again, that's typically a good one. Um, a, a, the environment. That has historically been an effective appeal. Again, in this particular political climate, it might not be the strongest appeal. And then re, re, an appeal to freedom or to values of some sort. Any kind of message that you're putting out there doesn't have to hit all five of these. But these seem to be the five um, themes that are, at least one of them is most likely to uh, resonate with a particular legislator. The other thing to think about is when people think about advocacy, they often think that it's um, all federal. But in fact, it can be on different levels. So it could be on the local level or the state level or the federal level. Um, there's lots of different things that go on in your local community that you could have an influence on. And your focus, your focus could either be a broad sweeping program like you're going to advocate for social emotional learning. Um, in programs for children because it's going to improve their cognitive ability, it's going to improve their social skills, it'll reduce bullying, it'll have a lot of, of impact. So it's kind of a broad sort of thing or it could be something that's a very targeted um, technical fix like we have to make sure that podiatrists are legally allowed to write prescriptions for orthotics and get reimbursement through their insurance company, something really, really specific. Um, and then your approaches can also be focused on big new sweeping programs, um, amending current legislation, or focusing on implementation once a law is passed. And I'll just say a word about this, this last point. The big sweeping stuff, that's rare. That's like the Affordable Care Act. You just don't see big things like that happen very often. Um, amending current legislation is, is the typical thing that gets done. 
um, but also focusing on implementations. Once a law is passed, the law does not have the details. The devil's in the detail. And you could have a really strong influence by just saying, well, you know, when you're doing this um, Medicare reimbursement, well, let's make sure that psychologists are included in those who are entitled to reimbursement. It's just a little interpretation of the law. Huge impact. So there are lots of different ways to think about advocacy. And I'm going to end um, with some recommendations for some things for all of you to think about. Really simple. Think about adding a policy implications section to your research articles. I think a lot of journals are now uh, requiring this. I would actually suggest that you probably talk to people who are influenced by these things. I go back and look at some of the things I used to write in terms of the social policy implications of my research. You know, it's kind of crappy, I think, relating to what Bob was saying. because. I wasn't talking to the people in the field. I hadn't bothered to find out what it is that they really need. And now when I do my policy statements, I talk to people in public health. I talk to practitioners. I do work on violence against women. I find out what it is that survivors need. Then your policy implications section can be really meaningful. Another thing that you can do is add a policy section to your, the course you teach. If you don't want to do the policy stuff yourself, bring in some guest lecturers. Bring in somebody from political science. Bring in somebody um, from a local environmental agency or a rape crisis center to talk to your students about this is what we need to learn from you as the researchers. The other thing is be active in your professional societies that do government relations kind of work. This morning, um, APA had one of the um, pre-conference sessions was on working with policymakers, and it was really effective and it was exciting to see um, so many of you in the room. Um, volunteer to do some advocacy work. APA, um, SRCD, the National Child Traumatic Stress um, network. There are lots of different groups that do really, really good advocacy training so that you, as an expert in an area, will feel comfortable going and delivering your message to the right audience. To reinforce what Bob said, write an op-ed. Take your work and translate it and make it relevant to um, the community. And of course, I have to put in a plug for the Congressional Fellowship Program. And during the reception, if any of you want to talk with me more about how, how you go about doing that, what it was like to live in DC for a year and roam the halls of Capitol Hill with a little badge on that gives you permission to go places others can't go. It's, it's, really, it's a very exciting, eye-opening experience. And with that, I will turn it over. Hello. I will start. Thanks for coming. Uh, as is the norm for people my age, we changed the title of our presentation. It is now Findings We Can Hang Our Hats On, Well-Being as Illustration. We, we also changed the authorship. Uh, Rhonda Jayarikrama is now a co-author, um, and he did an amazing job. He's really responsible for a lot of the uh, structure and the good parts of this. He didn't get his picture on the web page, so I'm going to put it here, much to his irritation, I'm sure. <laughs> He's a good guy. Please go talk to him. Uh, we're going to suggest as our point that if, if you're interested in increasing the relevance of social and personality psychology to the everyday person and to policy, one thing to do is to consider identifying findings that are highly relevant explicitly articulating the importance of all findings early in your journal article and explicitly, and spotlight those findings that are highly relevant. We're much in line with the message behind this new uh, journal that has just come out with the inaugural issue that Susan Fisk and Brendan Major and Jean Bergida are doing, where we want to say, let's put, let's find the relevant findings, put them in the journal, 
and describe their relevance. Let's make this a more common practice of what we're doing. When we talk about relevance and importance, what we're suggesting is that maybe we should also be police for good science, right? We're pretty good, we're pretty darn good police for bad science, right? I mean, I, you know, I was in this pre-conference today and, you know, I was, you know, I could, I could generate alternative explanations, you know, a dozen a minute, right? And everybody else could too, right? We're really good at that. We're really good at detecting bad methods or bad stats or overreaching conclusions. We're not so good at picking out the stuff that's really important and relevant. We're not as good at that. We don't practice those skills regularly. We don't practice those on a daily basis. The other thing is, you know, your colleagues' work is really important too. It can be other people's work that we focus on as the highly relevant findings. Uh, there's lots of ways to talk about relevance, but I'm running out of time, so I'm going to skip the rest of that. So um, when, I talk about art when we talk about articulating importance, why is this? Why do we want to articulate the importance? <laughs> What's important about that? So first of all, it's more interesting. So I was just teaching on Monday, uh, and I signed this article. It was a really great, sexy article. It was, I mean, it had sex in it. It was about, you know, all the horrible things that people that are Machiavellian and psychopathic and narcissistic do to other people, right? And I was like so excited about it. We spent, I warmed the students up. I got them all ready to go. We spent five or 10 minutes talking about all the terrible things college students do to each other, right? And they all, oh, they had good lists, like, you know, going to the bathroom in their friend's uh, washing machine and then running the rinse cycle. I mean, you know, they had, uh, you know, parking double in two spots and then lying about it to the police, um, you know, raping. Uh, they had uh, lying to your friends about when the exam is. I mean, they had all sorts of good stuff. They got really into it. They were really going. So we started the discussion the article, nothing, just dead. Finally, one student says, why did we read this article? I don't get, what was it important about it? It wasn't very interesting. And I'm like, what? Because it was a great article. I loved the article. So another student says, yeah, it seems like some kind of like questionnaire design article. It's just like what questionnaire you should use or something like that. And I was like, no, no, that's not the importance. The discussion went on about five or 10 more minutes. And you know, I looked back at the article and I had, I had, to, I had to admit that students are right because the authors put the importance of this article. Like, they barely mentioned it. They didn't use the word importance or significance or relevance, right? They had some passive sentence that was like, you know, barely mentioning it was important. And they were like, didn't really describe what's important and relevant about this. It, the authors did that. And, the, and what happens is the students didn't get it. Now, these are Wake Forest students. They're psychology majors. They're seniors. They're people who read original psychology articles and discuss them. If we can't convince them <laughs> that our stuff is relevant, man, we don't got a chance with anybody else. Right, so this, what we really want to do is we want to have articles that talk about why the article's important. It's good practice, we should be just doing it all the time. Um, and it's hard work. I mean, it's, when I write, why is my article important, it's the hardest thing I do. It's the, the most amount of time I spend per word is on why is this article important or interesting. And, it, and, and it's, to expect somebody who's, in, who's like reading this article, like skimming it in their free time to like figure out why this is important, you know, letting the data speak for themselves, that's almost impossible that they're going to get it. The author is the one who knows how to do that. Now, lots of you, all, I mean, I, many of you, so many social psychologists and personality psychologists are so good at describing the importance. I mean, many of you are really great at it, but as a field, I don't think we're all that great. I mean, what, what, what do we not mean when we talk about describing the importance? First of all, we don't mean saying that it's important. Don't say, well, this is important, period. <laughs> we mean saying why it's important, articulating it. We don't mean prescriptions. We don't say like, oh, well, this article means people should do this, right? And we don't mean doing immediately practical only kind of work or only applied work. Those, that's also really important, but it's not the only thing that's important. I mean, for example, think about this Higgs boson, right? How much do you think that costs to discover, right? <laughs> well, Forbes thinks 13.5 billion. To discover that there's a Higgs boson. There's not a single, okay, well, first of all, I should have mentioned they're probably a little uncharitable. It's probably only a quarter of that. So there's not a single practical piece of relevance that comes out of knowing that there are Higgs bosons, right? Nothing depends on that, right? But wait a minute. Of course, there's lots of practical relevance. We can all met, all of you will probably have like jumped to like seven or eight things that are relevant, right? That's what physicists do, right? They make it seem like their basic research it has all these practical implications. They make it really clear. We need to be better at making clear the downstream practical relevance of our work. So here, this is what, they, what Forbes said is about what, what's relevant. 
Sorry, I love this. CERN itself, that's where they got the boson, is responsible for your ability to read this article. I, it was online, I read it. The World Wide Web was developed in part to provide a means for the international community of physics to talk to each other. Oh, <laughs> Higgs boson, that, they got the web because we discovered the Higgs boson. <laughs> they convinced people of that. But better than that, they go on, here's another one. Oh, it generates so much data that new methods of computing and data crunching are being developed to handle it. <laughs> They're now convincing people that costs are benefits. Right? Costs of the work are benefits. I would love, in my next grant application, I'm going to try that. Um, and then they finally go on to one that's an actual benefit. What's more, advances in particle physics from the LHC are leading to the advancement of medical imaging. But notice how, that's how vague that is, and it's downstream, right? It's way downstream. But they were able to get convince Forbes magazine, pretty serious business, that it, that's why it's relevant. So there's a lot of findings we can hang our hats on. That inaugural issue of that journal had lots of really neat findings, all sorts of really cool stuff. I'm going to talk about one of them, which is well-being. Not because it's more important than others, those others, those are all, others are also important, it's because I know about it. There's a couple of other reasons why. As Oishi and Diener said, an ideal society is a society in which citizens are happy, feel satisfied, and find their lives meaningful. The ultimate goal of public policy should be to enhance citizens' subjective well-being. You know, that's a pretty strong statement. Maybe it's, maybe it's not the only ultimate goal. But maybe it's the ultimate goal of all policies to enhance well-being. So it's kind of, it is kind of important. It's right there. Okay. Uh, so maybe it's you know maybe maybe it is kind of the ultimate end. When people talk about well-being, what is it, what is well-being? You know, they think about like if you ask people what what is life for? What do you need out of life? One direction people go is they describe kind of like the objective things you need. You know, you need money and security, relationships, work, things like that. Those are all really important. Really, most of, most of what goes on in life is to increase one of those things. Another thing people mention is things like positive affect, negative affect, life satisfaction, and self-esteem, more subjective things that they experience. Or another version of these subjective things are like contribution to others and meaning in life. Um, I'm going to focus a little bit more on positive and negative affect this talk, the rest of the last few minutes of the talk. These are also like what life is about. In fact, all these other things on the left that are really important, that like most things feed into, are them themselves feed into those things, right? So in a sense, like, it's hard to come up with stuff that matters for a reason other than affecting those four things. I mean, it's kind of important stuff. So what are some findings about the predictors of well-being that we can hang our hats on? What are findings, when we say hang your hats on, we mean, you know, we're confident in them and they have relevance to people's lives. Well, so external models are the initial, initially popular ones. So things that, things that happen to us that make our lives better. What are some things that happen to us or that are conditions of our lives? One of them has to do with income, right? Income seems to be something that's really important to making ourselves happier. There's been a lot of research on this. They'll give you the same basic picture here. This is just one that I thought was kind of cool. What we find here is, is that income makes a huge difference in people's subjective well-being. As you can see, the countries, this is a between country analysis, but it works within countries too, you know, for individuals, doesn't matter how you do it. So between countries, you see that the countries where people are pretty miserable, have pretty low subjective well-being, are the ones where they have GDPs per capita of around, you know, under 5,000. And that every thousand per person of income that goes up, there's a huge impact on so, su subjective well-being there, on, the, on people's well-being. So it makes a huge difference. Up to about, well, here it's 15,000, it's often like 20,000, depends on exactly how you count the money. But somewhere between 10 and 20,000, it stops mattering, right? So after 10 or 20,000 annual income, income that matters very little to how much well-being you have. And this is, again, both true within countries and between countries. This is relevant to people's lives, right? How they want to choose what jobs they want to have, how they want to prioritize their time, what kind of job they want to have, where they want to put their uh, resources. It has a lot of relevance to people's lives. It also has a lot of relevance to policy. Now, not, this, isn't this isn't prescribe a particular policy, but it certainly should be relevant to any policy discussion about economy in a society that wants to make people have good well-being. Oh, how about marriage? That's another external factor. I just barely can only give you a couple findings today uh, that's relevant to well-being. Everybody thinks, well, getting married, that's really seems important. Uh, is it? Um, 
So Rich Lucas did this really brilliant study. This is a panel study, ten, tens of thousands of people, um, you know, years and years of data. And he looked at what happens the year that you get married. Well, it turns out that when people get married, they have a slight boost in their well-being, 0.23. It actually starts before they get married. Um, and it lasts about two years. So it's like two to four years of uh, a nice little boost, but then they adapt. Right? Everybody's familiar with that kind of thing. So the marriage has an effect. It's not huge. But what Rich did was really, what I thought was particularly brilliant, is he divided this up into the kind of, kind of marriage you got. So he started with the people who, who had a positive reaction, who initially like really liked, you know, really got into the, the marriage that they had, really had a positive reaction, but they stayed up there, right? For years, seven years later at least, um, they're much more, have much more well-being. And the people who had a negative reaction, well, they stayed down there, right? So it looks like the quality of the marriage you have is hugely important to your, well, your well-being for years on end. And the average comes out to be this tiny little effect. So again, implications for your life. You, know, you might want to know about this when you're thinking about who you're going to marry, whether you want to marry, <laughs> right? or about how you want to spend your free time. Like, you want to, do you want to, you know, is it more important to spend an hour at the gym or maybe an hour talking to your spouse? Right? So it, they might have implications. Uh, policy implications, it suggests we might want to think about what, you know, are we going to help support marriages to be of higher quality? Is that something we want to do as a policy? Another set of findings, I haven't seen a time thing yet, how am I doing? Oh good, okay. So another, so, so those are external determinants. It also turns out that internal determinants are incredibly important to well-being. Um, in fact, it's, it looks like they're like the most important thing, and in the form of traits. It turns out that traits are hugely important to well-being. Um, when you look at positive affect, it turns out that extroversion is the most important predictor. There is nothing that predicts how much positive affect happiness you have in your life than extroversion. Negative affect, there's nothing that predicts how much negative affect you have in your life more than your neuroticism level. Job success, it's actually tied for first place. Conscientiousness is tied for first place in predicting how much job success you have. It's tied with IQ. Those are the two highest predictors of job success. Marriage is predicted by agreeableness, conscientiousness, and emotional stability very strongly. Health is predicted by conscientiousness. Meaning in life is predicted by the personality traits. Maybe none of those matter because they're not life and death. Well, it turns out life and death is predicted by traits. In fact, conscientious, four of the big five traits predict how long you live. Conscientiousness, the effect is five years about, which is the same as coronary heart disease. I mean, it matters as much to how long you live as, as coronary heart disease. That's how you be happy. Okay. But importantly, we can, we can regulate the trade influences. It looks like, so oh yeah, what's the importance of that? Yeah, it tells us a lot about um, uh, how you might want to think about how your happiness, where it comes from. It comes from inside. It's a little scary. It comes from your traits. You might want to think about what your traits and whether you like them, whether you're interested in maybe modifying them or not. How would you go about that? That's some interesting information you might want to think about. It also might have some relevance for policy. If we want a society where people have high well-being, then one of the things we might want to spend some time on is understanding how traits work and how they can change. Because in fact, we might be able to change traits. For example, traits do change. We now know they change a lot in adulthood. Turns out therapy changes traits too. Brian Roberts is doing this great work right now. It's not published yet. Um, I guess he, ke he keeps adding more studies, I guess. So the, uh, it turns out that therapy changes all five of the big five traits. Extroversion neuroticism, particularly, the two that have the most to do with well-being. Um, so, and this is not intentional. People go into therapy for other reasons, but it turns out their traits change you know, pre to post, last for years. You can do it in experimental designs. You can show it and so on. People can even change their personality at the moment. So, for example, we did some research where we said, well, if extroverts are happier than introverts, and it's the biggest thing, does that mean you're doomed to what, you know, all of us academics are doomed to our unhappiness? Or does that mean that maybe you can take advantage of that? That can be information that has significance and relevance to you because you can actually be, be, be an extrovert if you feel like it or not, if you want to be happy. So we did it. We told people, be extroverted for 10 minutes or be introverted for 10 minutes in a discussion. And at the end of the discussion, we asked them, okay, how much fun was that? How much did you enjoy that? Wow, it's huge, whopping effects. This is like some studies, it's two standard deviations. It's one to two standard deviations from study to study that we do on this. And other people have replicated it too. It's very clear that when people act extroverted, they're happier. 
They enjoy it more than when they act introverted, regardless of whether they're dispositional extroverts or introverts. Now, this doesn't mean everybody should go out and be an extrovert. It's not prescriptive, right? It means that this is some information somebody could use if they want to, if their timing's right and everything. There's lots of times, please, we wouldn't want people acting extroverted. Um, but it does mean here's some information that is relevant for people that they might want to know about. So, in conclusion, if you want to make psychology, social and personality psychology more relevant to everyday life and to policy, consider identifying the findings in our field that are really relevant and articulate every study up front, early, explicitly, why this study is important. And, you know, just keep repeating the important findings to every audience we have, our, our friends, our students, you know, when we give talks, just keep repeating that stuff over and over again, and maybe it'll start to sink in. Thank you. All right, thanks for staying to the bitter end. Um, I want to thank Mark for inviting us to participate in this panel. It's really fun to get up here and think about social and personality psychology and how we can do a better job of being relevant. Um, as some of you know, I've spent a good part of my career being a faculty member in a psychology department, a very familiar place for many of us. Um, but over the last couple of years, I've been at the National Institutes of Health, specifically at the National Cancer Institute. And it's been a really eye-opening experience in many ways, and I'm just going to tell you about two ways in which it's been eye-opening. One is that there are a lot of health problems out there. And I'm not just talking about smoking and obesity and all the ones we hear about in the papers. There are many, many health problems and issues uh, that need to be addressed. The other eye-opening thing is that we're not often at the table addressing those problems. Problems that really have a social and personality emphasis to them or an angle to them. Um, but we're not there really to offer that angle. So that's what I want to talk about today. Let me start by reminding you of what the mission statement is for SPSP. You can read it here. To produce and disseminate knowledge to the profession and the public for the public good. I found that a little surprising when I found that on the website um, because we don't often talk about the public good and the work that we do. It's kind of implicit. It was there when social psychology started, for example. Think about Milgram's work and, and Solomon Osh and all the work done following World War II. There was a public good emphasis there, but it's not something we spend a lot of time thinking about. I thought I'd put this back to back with NIH's mission statement, which is to seek fundamental knowledge, enhance health, lengthen life, and reduce illness and disability. Pretty much the same thing, but focused on one particular public good, namely public health, the health of our public. Well, we have much to offer to address uh, problems in public health, and this is just a sampling of those things. Um, we address causal and mediating factors. We consider general processes that are relevant across multiple different domains. We take a convergent evidence approach to understanding phenomena. And we also consider interactions between the person and the environment. These are all strengths of our discipline that tell us something about significant health problems. We're also nice people, but that's, I didn't put that on the list. We're good to collaborate with. Um, and our approach in personality and social psychology is to pursue stimulating counterintuitive and complex research questions that scrutinize common sense models of human behavior. This is something that Ross Leper and Ward reminded us of in 2010. This is why I got into the field. I took Introduction to Social Psychology 30 years ago, and I read Influence by Bob Cialdini, read that line about being a patsy, and I was, I was, that was it. That was the moment I decided I wanted to be a social psychologist. Um, and why? I did not become a social psychologist because I was interested in health problems. I didn't become a social psychologist because I was interested in any problems. I was interested in puzzles. I was interested in trying to address interesting puzzles. And that's what we do. That's what we're trained to do. It's, we're, we're trained to think this way. Um, and it's why many of us get in the field. And incidentally, I applaud those of you who have gotten into this field because you want to address problems. That wasn't me. It was the puzzles that really drew me in. But let me tell you about a couple of the puzzles that we think about at the National Cancer Institute. And this is, these are just examples that I spend time thinking about. Um, but I could pull these examples from other areas of health or other domains like law, business, and, and so on. 
So HPV vaccination, probably not something you think about very much. Um, HPV is human papillomavirus. It's a sexually transmitted virus. It usually clears in most people, and about 40 uh, to 50 percent of sexually active individuals have HPV in their system at some point. Well, there's now a vaccination for it, and it's a good idea to get this vaccination because HPV is a predictor of, of cervical cancer, and we can reduce rates of cervical cancer a great deal simply by getting adolescents to go into their doctors and get an HPV vaccination. This is a vaccination that was developed at the National Cancer Institute and now sold and marketed by Merck. Well, it turns out that HPV vaccination is a social problem. Why is it social? Well, if any of you have teenage daughters, or teenage sons for that matter, you know that talking to them about health issues is not the easiest thing to do. I heard a joke recently that um, if, if you're a father of a teenager and you're standing in the middle of the forest and there's no one there to hear you, are you still wrong? <laughs> that, that's the experience I often have. And so you know that it's difficult to talk to adolescents. Now we're talking about a sexually transmitted disease, and we want to bring in our adolescent, our teenager, into the doctor to get vaccinated because of a sexually transmitted disease. Can you imagine that conversation? Now you have to have a conversation about when they're having sex, when, they're, when sexual debut is happening. That's a conversation that involves communication. It involves um, issues that we think about with regard to personal relationships. That's what we do. This is what we do. And yet, folks who do research on HPV vaccination are not necessarily thinking about that. HPV vaccination is also about decision making. And it's also about self-regulation. And why is that? Because it's not something you go in and do once. You have to go back three times, three doses, to get vaccinated for HPV. Think about all the different self-regulatory kinds of issues that come up in making sure that people get to that third dose. Second problem we talk a lot about at National Cancer Institute is clinical trials. The backbone of biomedical research is drug development, developing drugs that address disease, right? Well, how do you do that work? You recruit patients to do it. Patients who come in and engage in phase one trials to figure out if a given drug actually is dangerous or not, phase two trials, phase three trials to look at efficacy and effectiveness of the drugs. This is what people in biomedical research do. <clears throat> It turns out that fewer than 5% of eligible patients for clinical trials actually enroll in those clinical trials. So what ends up happening is these drugs often don't get tested in the ways they should, and many clinical trials don't accrue enough patients to be able to complete the trial. <clears throat> Excuse me. So why is that? Well, there are a lot of people out there, a lot of researchers out there who have all kinds of theories about it, and they publish these theories. Are they theories that have a social personality angle to them? Sometimes. Mostly not. And yet, enrolling in clinical trials has a lot of social and personality components to it. So for example, emotion. People are often asked to engage in a clinical trial at the moment they have just learned they have cancer, right? Or some other horrible disease. There's a cartoon that I often show in talks um, that shows what happens when a physician tells a patient that they have cancer. They say, you have cancer, and then everything else is gobbledygook. The patient hears nothing else after that about what they're supposed to do, where they're supposed to go next. It's all gobbledygook, because all they hear is the cancer, and now the emotions take over. Well, emotion plays a role in the decisions to engage in clinical trials. What about altruism? Phase one clinical trials are trials simply to assess whether a drug is dangerous or not. It probably is not going to help you, but it can help a lot of other patients. That's what we call altruism, or pro-social behavior. Who studies pro-social behavior? Not too many folks outside of psychology. Certainly sociologists do, some anthropology. This is the discipline that looks at altruism and the predictors of altruism. Stigma, optimism, these are all factors that play a role in decisions to engage in clinical trials. The last example I want to use is e-cigarettes. Have you seen these things yet? These are these little machines. Um, they're basically electronic cigarettes. You put in a battery, or they come with a battery. You put in a flavored liquid that delivers nicotine into your system. And by the way, there are 7,000 flavors available on the market right now. Everything you can imagine, bazooka gum, um, cotton candy, all kinds of flavors that appeal to um, teenagers and young smokers. And these are not regulated by the FDA the way combustible cigarettes are. So this is a real issue to be thinking about. What, what do we need to worry about with regard to e-cigarettes? Well, lots of things. One of them is social norms. Social norms, we know, play a significant role in behavior. 
They certainly did with regard to smoking combustible cigarettes when combustible cigarettes were first introduced. Now we've got, we have to start the whole process over again and think about these social norms. And who studies social norms and understands the way they're transmitted? Um, persuasion and stigma are also related to e-cigarettes. So stigma about lung disease, for example, and the link between smoking and lung disease. So those are just a couple of examples. You can also just open up the newspaper, of course, and see many other examples of things that really need um, some attention. So measles outbreak in the US tops 150 cases. We've been reading and hearing about this. A lot of this is about communication, about risk communication in particular, about relationships, about vaccination. Life after Ebola, uh, mammogram rates, and how about this one on the bottom? Puerto, Puerto Rico's controversial proposal would fine the parents of obese children. Wow, right? That's a, that's a social kind of question. Well, I would like to submit, and my colleagues uh, who have worked on similar kinds of issues will agree and have contributed to this discussion, I'd like to submit that doing this work not only benefits public health, but benefits social and personality psychology. So first of all, it establishes the robustness of the phenomena and the theories that we develop. So we develop them in our laboratory, often with college students, which I'll say something about in a moment. Um, and then we take them out in the world, and lo and behold, they work or they don't work in other populations or other settings. That actually helps us in terms of basic knowledge and understanding the phenomena we're studying. It also stretches our thinking about human behavior beyond the educated 18 to 22 demographic. I mentioned I'll get to that in a moment. Um, and it makes our theories better. There are actually a number of theories in social and personality psychology that have improved or changed in some way because of work done in a health context. Cognitive dissonance theory, for example, was developed by Leon Festinger in part because he was a smoker and couldn't possibly understand why a smoker would smoke cigarettes knowing that smoking was unhealthy. That inspired cognitive dissonance. What do you do with that, right? Turns out that later work in the 1980s and 1990s started questioning some of the assumptions of cognitive dissonance and did so in a health context. This is work by Jeff Stone and Elliot Aronson at Santa Barbara. So that's just one of many examples where a theory benefited from work done in a health context. Now, we've done this work. This is the good side of the story. We've, we've done this before. Personality and psychology have been at the table for all kinds of serious health problems. And here are some of them, nutrition, gum disease, obesity, smoking, and so on, heart disease. Um, and here are some names of people you might recognize. They did this work. Kurt Lewin, some of his earliest work was on how to get people to eat more nutritiously. So we do have a history of addressing um, health problems. And in fact, there's some work right now and many examples of work being done right now that addresses real world uh, health problems. I just wanted to focus on two that I find really interesting, and these are two of many. Um, so Heike Mahler and colleagues have done some interesting work where they show people the damage done to their skin using UV photography. And that has an impact on their beliefs about skin cancer and their behaviors related to skin cancer. Second example is Emily Fox's work um, Emily is part of a growing discipline in uh, health neuroscience and in communication neuroscience. And what she finds is that you can look in the medial prefrontal cortex and predict what kinds of advertisements, like the one here, uh, might actually cause people to stop smoking or call quit lines to stop smoking. And it turns out that looking in your, pre, uh, your medial prefrontal cortex does a better job at predicting which advertisements are going to work than asking you which of the ones are going to be most effective. No shock there. I mean, we have a whole history of knowing that people's self-reports and introspection usually are not very uh, accurate in terms of predicting behavior. And here's a case where neuroscience can tell us something about public health. Sometimes this work can be taken to a large scale. Um, so Bob Cialdini, of course, has done lots of work. And Bob, this is a comment more on the, the, the quality and the length and the impact of your work, not on your age. <laughs> but Bob has been doing work on social norms for a long, long time. And this has been taken to scale in many different ways. Um, a colleague, Pascal Sheeran, who's in the audience, I think I saw him out there, pointed me to an article that just came out by Nieder et al. in 2014 um, showing that implementation intentions can be taken to scale in, an, in a country, in the United Kingdom, where what they did is they incorporated an implementation intentions intervention to get people to screen. Not just in a little laboratory, in a country, really in a health plan in this case. 
And of course, there's nudge. Uh, Thaler Sunstein, we've heard this all before. Behavioral economics is a wonderful field, but I think we all know that a lot of behavioral economics is social and personality psychology dressed up in new bottles, as it were. Um, taking work by Cialdini and others on norms and defaults uh, in, from decision making and using it in ways to address um, serious problems. I would like to argue, despite that, uh, all the good news about the good things we've done in the past, um, that we can do a lot better. We can do more. And I think that's why Mark wanted me to talk today, and to talk about how it is that our work can become more relevant to solving real problems. Um, this is just the first page of a paper that we just had published in PSPR this month, and it reviews many of the ways in which personality and social, uh, social psychology have had an impact, but potentially could do more. Let me just tell you about some of the challenges I have when I'm at NIH trying to defend personality and social psychology and trying to make sure that the work is making a meaningful difference. How about language differences? If you're walking on the street towards a biomedical researcher and you want that biomedical researcher to walk the other way, one thing you could do is just say you have the Ebola virus. That might be one way. But even worse is to say you have a theory. They're going to run away, right? Now, does that mean they don't appreciate theory and mechanism and all the lovely things we care about? Not necessarily, because often what another discipline thinks of as a theory is very different than what we define as a theory. So that one example is one of many I could give you where the language differences get in the way of trying to understand how two disciplines can work together. The disciplinary norms we have in publication and in training um, sometimes can make a difference. And also, we have trouble translating phenomena to real outcomes. And you've heard this before several times in, in previous talks in the symposium. The importance of focusing on language, the importance of dumbing things down, and that's not quite the right word, distilling things down, as Bob said, for the lay public so that uh, they can understand what it is that we're doing and how it's relevant. Let me just tell you about some relevant metrics um, that are published in this paper that I just mentioned. We found that um, in 400 studies that we looked at in 2012, published in JPSP and PSPB, two of our most popular journals, fewer than 4% had any health emphasis whatsoever. And that was using a very broad definition of health emphasis. Um, we found that most of the papers don't have many authors. That's not a bad thing or a good thing, but I can tell you that much of the work that addresses the health problems I told you about is done by interdisciplinary teams where there are more than just two or three authors, and the other authors are not the guy across the hall in the developmental psychology program as opposed to the social psychology program. It's with people in medical schools, cancer centers, and other places um, where there's expertise in diseases, for example, that we don't have as much expertise in. We also found that there were fewer than 20% of studies that measured anything approximating behavior. If any of you read Baumeister's work, um, this is now back in 2007, um, showing that we don't publish behavior very much hasn't changed in the last several years. It doesn't seem to be the case that we measure behavior too much. Is that bad? No, of course not. Um, we all have done important work that doesn't measure behavior, but perhaps looks at proximal predictors of behavior. Nothing wrong with that. But if an entire field is not publishing much on behavior, what is that going to do for users of our research who want to look at behavioral outcomes and change behavioral outcomes? And also very few health-related samples in the studies that we looked at. And just to give you a, a feel for that, we found, uh, again, looking at papers in 2012 in both journals, uh, JPSP and PSPV, 76% of the studies used college students. 76%. Now, I will be the first to tell you, I have published many papers using college student samples, so I'm as guilty as anyone else. We, we all do this, and it's a great resource, and there's nothing wrong with doing research with college students. I would argue, though, that there's something wrong with a discipline publishing on 76% of college students or using college students 76% of the time, given the many ways in which social and psychological processes, uh, social and personality processes, change over the lifespan. You can see that there's another 13% using internet samples. That's called mTurk um, or other samples. And if you compare that to what's happening in health psychology, so I pointed out the two most common uh, journals in health psychology here, health psychology and adults of behavioral medicine, you can see that they're using college students much less often. They have health-related samples about 40% of the time and community samples about 41% of the time. And those are the journals that users, people developing interventions, are often going to, um, to design their interventions. Okay. I wanted to show you that I actually know how to use PowerPoint. Do you like that? <laughs> so because of all of these problems, we might have a problem with relevance. 
that's about as good as it gets for PowerPoint for me. So I want to um, talk a little bit about how we can increase relevance, how we can go beyond um, some of the barriers that I've talked about here. One thing we can do is, is measure behavior. And you know what? We all, or most of us, seem to have one of these things, um, an iPhone or some other smartphone. These things are magic. They can do all kinds of things. And they can, do, uh, they can measure behavior and measure psychological processes in ways we never could before. There are people out there using them, and many of them don't have the background in personality and social psychology, perhaps that they should have, to design interventions with them. If you look for health apps, you go onto Apple Store or Google Store and download an app that has something to do with quitting smoking or eating better, 90% um, of those apps have no evidence basis whatsoever. Okay? And so it's important for us to be able to use apps and use the new technology to measure behavior and intervene on behavior. And so we should be collaborating with people who design these things. We need to market the work to users, and you've heard that from the other speakers here today, so I won't say more about that. And then we also need to embrace many of the changing norms in science. Um, and many of these changes, many of these developments in science are represented in the program at SPSP this weekend. Really nice to see. And I encourage you to seek out symposia that look at these kinds of issues, such as using big data. And I don't even want to talk about big data because there are so many ways to define it and so many ways to think about it. That's another talk entirely. But it's a different way of thinking about data than most of us are trained to think about. Using new measurement and analytic tools. Thinking about the fact that our science occurs outside of the academy very often. One of my roles is to serve on a committee out of the White House on the National Science Technology Council's um, Social, Behavioral, and Economic Subcommittee. Long title. And uh, what we're doing this year in May is we're having a meeting to discuss the future of graduate education in the behavioral and social sciences. And one of the major foci of, these, of this meeting will be on the fact, uh, uh, will be on the fact that Many of our graduates, many of our PhD graduates from our graduate programs are not going into academia anymore, in part because the jobs aren't there, but also because there are a lot of very appealing jobs out there for social and personality PhDs. And that's where they're going. They're going to Google, they're going to Facebook, they're going into industry, they're going into pharma. What are they doing there with the social and personality psychology they've been trained to do? We need to think about that in terms of how we train. Um, interdisciplinary science, I made reference to the fact that we can do even more in terms of collaborating with individuals outside of our own field. Um, and then implementation. Greg Walton and others talk about the fact that we should have another training program or another discipline called psychological engineering. The idea that you take what we've learned in psychology and then engineer it to make it work in real settings. And I applaud Greg and others who have done that in educational settings with um, all kinds of really interesting interventions based on self-affirmation and on growth mindsets and so on. Okay, I also want to highlight the fact that the resources do exist to do this work. There are other samples out there other than college students. Again, college students are great. Um, many of them are sitting here, in fact, and I applaud you for coming to SPSP as a student. Um, but they shouldn't be, we, we shouldn't be the psychology of the college undergraduate. There's a lot of professional support out there to do this kind of work. It turns out that if you were doing health research, um, say, 20 years ago, often you would hide the fact that you were doing it. And I have colleagues in the field who have told me this, that they would go to the health psychology meetings or the behavioral medicine meetings, and they would not tell any of their friends, their, their colleagues in social psychology, they were doing this. It was not a good thing. You were stigmatized for doing that work. That's not the case anymore. And in fact, the Social Personality and Health Network had a phenomenal pre-conference uh, today and has had one for several years now, illustrating some of the phenomenal work that happens at the interface of social personality and health. The support is there. This network has a great website. They have webinars that you can go to to learn more about doing this kind of work. Um, take advantage of these kinds of resources. There are funding initiatives out there to support this work. Uh, we at NIH have a number of different funding initiatives that social and personality psychologists should be applying to, and in some cases are, but not always. Uh, the new Science of Behavior Change initiative coming out of NIH is all about behavior change. Well, we know something about that, right? And um, we've had folks in personality and social psychology, Tim Strauman is an example, who have been funded by these kinds of mechanisms. Um, but I will tell you that I find it interesting that I don't see as many applications as I, as I would expect from this discipline that address behavior change outcomes. At NCI, we have a number of mechanisms, one on affective science that came out last year. Um, and these kinds of mechanisms are very useful in terms of trying to apply the work we do um, to serious health problems. 
There are lots of data out there, um, and not just big data. So MIDAS is the Midlife in the United States project um, where they took a large sample of middle-aged individuals. They have a twin uh, sample, a twin subsample in the study, and it's a longitudinal study. And they include many social psychological measures and personality measures that have been published on. Um, and yet I find that most people are not aware of this, at least in this field, um, that this incredible data set exists. And that's just one of many. And then there are lots of ideas out there, too. That's an important resource. Um, and I'd like to point you to one. Back in 2013, there was a special issue in health psychology very explicitly on theoretical innovations and social, in social personality psychology and how they could be used um, and tested in health contexts. And that's, that's a great place to just sift through and find some interesting ideas. There are lots of symposia here at the conference um, that are relevant to health outcomes, some of which are explicitly relevant in the titles and in the talks, and some of which could be even more relevant um, if the investigators were able to get a grant from NIH to transcend what they're doing in their laboratory to a specific health outcome. I want to wrap up by um, asking a question, which is, do we think as a discipline, personality and social psychology, do we think we're in Pasteur's quadrant? And what is Pasteur's quadrant? Well, Pasteur, of course, Louis Pasteur developed pasteurization, um, and in so doing, contributed both to basic research, right? He was addressing a basic question, but also an applied question, a question that had to do with food storage and food preparation. So we call that, food, uh, we call that Pasteur's quadrant, and this was illustrated in a book by Stokes in 1997. There are many other investigators out there, Niels Bohr, Thomas Edison, who may be doing purely basic research or purely applied research. My colleagues and I would like to argue that that's a ridiculous distinction. Um, in fact, there's no such thing as just basic or just applied research. There's a nice integration of the two, and there shouldn't be a negative correlation, as Jackie was saying, between wanting to do work that contributes to conceptual knowledge and work that addresses a problem. I think most of us would like to be in Pasteur's quadrant, and I would question whether our field really is as close to that quadrant as it needs to be. So some conclusions. Um, I would like to argue, and I hope I've convinced you at least a little bit, whoops, I can leave that up there, um, that health is filled with complex puzzles, many puzzles, and many puzzles that are like the puzzles that we got in the field to try to solve, that we have the expertise to address them and with many tools and resources, and we, of course, are going through an intense period of self-reflection right now, thinking about data fraud, replicability, generalizability, and lots and lots of hours and effort uh, being put into addressing all of those. But let's be clear here, all of those things are a means to an end. If we solve data fraud and we solve repli replicability and generalizability, we're still not necessarily going to be relevant. And so relevance really is the end here, and that's what I think Mark is trying to convey um, in the symposium and in his thinking about where this field can go. Now, I did have one more slide, so let's see if I can get to it. Oh, I can. Great. Um, I, I want to thank uh, many colleagues who have contributed to discussions about these issues, um, contributed to the PSPR paper that I mentioned. They're listed in the middle there. Uh, my colleagues at NCI listed up on top. And also, NCI supports an ex extramural group called the, okay, here we go, Cognitive, Affective, and Social Processes in Health Research, CASPER, uh, working group. And this group spends a lot of time thinking about how to translate everything we do in personality and social psychology over to addressing health problems in a way that really reinforces this two-way street between making a contribution and then reinforcing our, our conceptual knowledge and our theories and making them better. So I thank all these folks for their help. I encourage you to email me with your thoughts about any of this. And I'm done, so I turn it over to you, Mark. All right, I want to thank the four speakers. I promised we would get you out of here by a quarter of seven. We have just about made it, so we're going to forego questions and comments, but the speakers will be up here. If you have questions or things you want to talk to them about, feel free to come up. Thanks for coming.